Hello and welcome to Excavations, where we finally, after months, finish one essay by Hal <laughs> Draper. Um, and that essay is the 1947 essay, The Inevitability of Socialism, The Meaning of a Much Abused Formula, um, which I will, spoiler alert, this has been an interesting read, but it's not actually one of Graeber's better pieces. Um, uh, although I think digging into the weeds of it, I've actually learned a lot that I did not know. Um, and while... Initially, I came in thinking I knew most of the stuff about the 1940s positions of Trotskyists around the world. I discovered in the last episode, I actually didn't. And um, and it was even weirder and harder to follow than I thought. So, Imagine that. The way that we started with a tree of life of Trotskyism. That was just the American Trotskyism. I didn't well, do Trotskyism in any other country. Now we know about the IKD abroad. Kind of. <laughs> We'll get there. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> so we are starting with fatalism and reformism, uh, which is way down at the end of this essay. And we will finish this essay tonight, come hell or mm -hmm. high water. Uh, it's actually only about nine paragraphs left, but who knows how long it'll take us. Um, okay, so let us begin. Graber, uh, Graber, Draper. I mean, they're both dead, right? Oh, that's probably too soon. Uh, Draper. Um, a second impact of the theory of predestined inevitability should be noted as expected on the question of organizations. We asked with regard to our fanatical Calvinist, why should a man be spurred to activity to bring about that which is already preordained? Logically, there can be only one organizational conclusion, but there is no law which is obliges any man to be logically consistent, and there are many which often force him to drop his eyes with the logic of politics stare him piteously stares when the logic of politics stares him pite piteously in the face okay that's a fucking mixed metaphor dude all right anyway um normally he's such a good writer that's what, that's what <laughs> i, I got. find that one but it is a bit silly uh drop his eyes uh, when the logic of politics stares him pitilessly in the face i mean i think it's that you have Okay, this is my English teacher coming out here. Yeah. The logic modified of politics stares. So you have an ant an anthropomorphism, but also the important part is in a prop uh, in a preposition. Right. <laughs> who would be the who would play the logic of politics in the scene? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so it's a double abstraction, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is personified um you at this point you would write specify <laughs> the notes on the side well i find it funny because draper's usually actually for a marxist polemicist or theorist remarkably clear mm -hmm. um as we continue this series i promise you we're gonna get in the people where we're gonna be like what the fuck does that mean let me like do you a whole for, for draper's uh classical greek references yeah yeah um yeah anyway so uh we have not one but three answers to consider to the paradoxical question what kind of organization do you do you need to bring about a foredoomed event i like that word foredoomed yeah that's very i i yeah i i've been reading a lot of mid 20th century fantasy novels particularly like <laughs> uh tolkien and the words of future cream uh king and all this stuff and i have to remind myself that doomed does not mean dead it just means faded faded exactly <laughs> yeah 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 um, inevitable and foredoomed as synonyms is interesting yeah okay so the um, first the first answer no, no party par organization is necessary at all mm -hmm. this is a consistent conclusion needless to say it has never been held by any organized movement. <laughs> uh, there is palmatic, of course. Uh, and I have heard it from a, from the breed known as Parlor Pink, who is utterly convinced that socialism is coming apace, who is naturally delighted at the prospect, and who is so void of doubt on the subject that any stir on the behalf of the work of uh, any stir on his behalf is a work of super interrogation. 
but just alas, super irrigation, which super I have irrigation. just doing too much. More yeah, than what's required. Okay, but alas, the defects of human nature that even this admirable specimen of consistency uh, occasionally wretches himself from the strict demands of logic in order to contribute a few dollars when Norman Thomas runs for president. Do you have any idea who Norman Thomas is? He was a, like a he was like a progressive candidate, like from. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, he was one of the uh, two, he was a Presbyterian minister and socialist pacifist who was, uh, okay, yeah, so he was a progressive, but he was one of the, of the guard of the Socialist Party of America when they really didn't matter anymore. So like in the 40s. Uh, in late 30s, way after their heyday, after Debs, after Victor Berger, etc. Gotcha. Uh, that's what I thought. I was making sure that I was right about that. I was like, yeah, I think he was a socialist, but he may, I was like, could he have been part of like Henry Rollins' progressive party? That hasn't yeah. really happened yet. Um, anyway. Um, it's so, interesting because Paul Maddock came up in a footnote previously. Well, this is interesting, too, because he's basically a, like this actually equates two different positions, mm -hmm. but he's right that they actually say the same thing about party. So this there's Parmatic, of course, and for that, he means cancel communism, which Paul Matic is mm -hmm. the American exemplar. But like the Dutch cancel communist position all the way back to Anton Panikuk opposed the existence of a socialist party, opposed the member. They opposed any, any workers joining official unions. Um, yeah, they were super strict on what they thought a workers organization, uh, would be, which is basically a, a council movement alone and, and unions attached to that. Um, so, uh, but it's interesting because he's right, even though he's doing this very slyly, he's basically saying, well, the interest, you know, what's implied by this is like, well, the council communist and then the Bernsteinite parlor pink who just thinks we're going to naturally develop towards socialism a la joseph schupender because it's just mm -hmm. going to happen right um basically they're the same like their position on this is the same that's what he's saying sure and yeah he's not technically wrong about that but it's interesting because basically like paul maddock is the opposite and like how and like how strict and delineated like you can't get more strict on your version of marxism in some ways than paul maddock that's like, interesting that is and, an interesting juxtaposition. Whereas, like, the parlor pink is, like, people post-Bernstein, the Fabian Socialist, uh, the Progressive Party, um, the parts of the German historical school who thought socialism was inevitable, it was just going to happen as a natural result of monopoly capital. Uh, people associated with the Second International Towns the Hilferding even kind of said this, although they did think a defensive revolution may be necessary. Mm -hmm. So... Okay. And they did think, and obviously the SP day believed in the party, but like there is a certain consistency where you say, oh, we don't need a socialist party. Oh, but I will occasionally vote for Norman Thomas. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Throw, throw a few bucks at his campaign just to make sure it goes well. Right. Even though his win is inevitable or whatever. Yeah, okay. I'll just read the, the footnote about um, Matic. Mm -hmm. really fast because i'm not sure if we even did that when it came up earlier but I don't think so. outside yeah outside the trotskyist mm -hmm. movement ad palmatic whose pamphlet the inevitability of communism walks around the question just as uneasily this ancestor of johnsonism notes quote the alternatives presented by the communist manifesto communism or barbarism but he does not permit himself to be dissuaded that history is inexorably fated to achieve communism through the spontaneous revolutionary action of the masses without the conscious intervention and leadership of a vanguard party there you go yeah that's i mean that's an interesting thing here um then there's and actually interestingly a whole lot of draper's younger disciples who are t t tied to him in the 60s uh, are, um, are going to become anti-partyists. This includes like the anarchist Ron, uh, Ron Tabor, who ends up being an anti-Marxist, um, but still a socialist somehow. Mm -hmm. The, the anarcho-Marxist Wayne Price, uh, who, who's like very fond of, of Draper, but says Draper just was too soft on the state. Um, so it's interesting that like that position is a position of a lot of people 
later associated with Draper. Um, okay, so this gets us to number two. No revolutionary party organization is necessary. In socialist history, the classic exponents of the plain and simple flat inevitably theory with the theoreticians of the Second International and in particular of the, of the German social democratic reformists. This is actually an unfair caricature. While you it is so? true, yeah, it is. It absolutely is true. Um, they also deduced from an extensive textual acquaintance with Marxism that socialism was coming waft on the wings of objective historic process. Being students of Marx as well as practical reformist politicians, they were both able and willing to transfuse this theory of historic process with a few more drops of Marx's blood. <laughs> For had not Marx said, history does nothing. It possesses no colossal riches. It fights no fights. Rather, it is man, real living man, who acts, possesses, and fights in everything. It is by no means history which uses man as a means to carry out its ends, as if it were a person apart. Rather, history is nothing but the activity of man in pursuit of his ends. This is actually important because I think you'll see this use of history even from people who aren't like this. But what I will say is he is he's kind of correctly characterizing Bernstein mm -hmm. and maybe to a lesser extent, like the S pay day after the S pay day accepts um, some positions in a cabinet position of a non-socialist government. That's what starts the, the whole end of the unified, the unified front. Um, and so by the time you get to probably after after Kautsky and Bernstein leave the SP day, this is true. And it's true for Bernstein kind of, okay. um, but it's not really true of the second international as a whole. Um, are it's Did they not speak at all about revolutionary parties? Yeah. They talked about the need for, they talked about the need for a political revolution and a defensive revolution because they figured they'd be attacked. Okay. So yes, it seems a bit like a caricature. Yeah, this is a caricature. This is a character common to Marxist Leninist and Trotskyist, but it is a caricature. Um, you will note that he doesn't like, the, and I get, I've gotten annoyed with this with with uh, Marxists in general. Like I, I've been reading some some literature on the Patreon side that just does this like an insane amount. Well, they will accuse somebody else of having a position, but not quote them or not even say specifically who they're accusing of that position, which is fine on, say, Twitter, but it is not fine <laughs> on in a... Theoretician uh, subtweeting, that's interesting. Right, but it is not fine in something like this where you're like, well, is that really what they said? Like, sure. I mean, this was a main problem that we had in the last sections that we went over, right. to the point that you had to go back to the primary sources and read next to you know, the claims here. and kind right, of That one, it was so vague that I didn't even know what he was talking about. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, what is he say? Like, this is about some, this is some inter Trotskyist debate about an interpretation of a text that he's not, that he's quoting from, but not giving any of the context for. Literally jumping to the conclusions without right. contextualizing. Okay. All right. The activity of man then is also part of the historic process. In fact, a part without which history fails to process at all. And so a socialist organization is necessary. But had not Engels described how capitalism is being transformed by the invading of socialist society? Is capitalism being changed over to socialism as an acceptably petrifying wood changes into stone, molecule by molecule? And if socialism is inevitable anyway, then all that has to be done is to build the movement, and the goal will take care of itself. A movement, yes, revolution, no. A socialist movement, yes. Revolution, no. No. Interaction <laughs> yeah. has become obsolete since Marx discovered the objective historic process to take care of the business for us. The inevitability of socialism thesis becomes the inevitability of gradualism. Marx turns in his grave, Engels being unable to do so since his ashes have been consigned to the sea. <laughs> Such a lame <laughs> turn of phrase for the end there. <laughs> that's, that's funny, but I don't know why it's there. <laughs> No. Uh, <laughs> uh. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, fatalism and the party question. The First World War, the Russian Revolution, and the revival of revolutionary Marxism by the Bolshevik movement exploded this reformist claptrap. 
Cannon and Johnson stand on the shoulders of this movement. They cannot go back to the social democratic version of inevitability without breaking with it. But their theory of inevitability nonetheless shadows their concept of organization. Let us be clear about the relationship between the two. The social democrat did not deduce their reformism from their theory of inevitability. The latter played the role of Marxist justification for the former. I actually kind of agree with that. Yeah. Given, given a period of expanding capitalism, an apparent prospect of limitless reforms, a period during which labor aristocracy of the advanced countries grew fat on the crumbs of imperialism, the reform... That's funny because that's normally held to be a Maoist position. Hmm. I just point that out because Maoists will say Trotskyists don't believe that, and they actually do. Hmm. The reformism of the Second International was, was yielding of the socialist movement to the degenerative social tendencies and forces of its time. Their theory of inevitability created out of scraps of Marx quotations was on one hand, the ideological manifestation of this process. And on the other, the rationalization and bridge with the past. It's a little bit more complicated because it seems like Ingalls actually endorsed the program. Um, and while Ingalls did think a, a, a defensive insurrection would be necessary, and when Kowski published Ingalls' letters, he actually pulled that part out. Mm -hmm. um, in general, it's not true that they didn't that it, the SPD did not think of itself as a revolutionary party, and the Second International in general didn't. Um, that was what it was accused of by the Third International, um, okay. particularly in the Twenty One Points and the what we now call the ABCs of Communism, which is a communist program of nineteen eighteen. But it's not entirely true of the movement. If people want to listen to this, I've talked to. Uh, people from pro cult films and Ben Lewis about the history of the second international and what happened. So the, and uh, we talk about this a good bit anyway, but the element of post hoc justification uh, brought together from a collage of Marxist quotes does sound at least reasonable. No, I think that's actually somewhat true. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think also it, it just became clear it, over time, um, it became clear that the SPD was an electoral party, even w willing even to suppress other socialists. Um, and so, you were know, they repressing the revolutionaries among them? Uh, eventually, I mean, um, the Freikorp was partly assembled and allowed for by a by a, a SPD government okay. um, that ran by Ebert. But interestingly enough, when people like, oh, Kelsky and Bernstein killed Rosa, they'd actually left the SP day at that point, which is one of the great ironies of the split between the Bolsheviks and the Second International. It's, it's based off of the war credits, but that actually also splits Kalski from the SP day. Um, because while he doesn't stop it, um, he can no longer feel like he can be in democratic centralist part of the party and they leave because gotcha. um, they oppose the war. All right. Uh, in our epoch, the degenerative social influences which arise from the noxious exhalations of a decaying world and which breathe their vapors also on the revolutionists are no longer those of an expanding capitalism and a bribed labor aristocracy. Oh, that's funny because he's wrong about that. <laughs> he's yeah, very know. wrong about that. Although that's not that's not clear in 1947, to be fair. But like everybody thought that ca like it's Trotskyist doctrine. Mm -hmm. That after the Second World War, that capitalism would hit a profitability crisis and collapse. That is also Marxist Leninist doctrine, too. Like that was something the two sides agreed on. Yeah. And it didn't happen, which prompted a whole bunch of new theories of capital, which, you know, we get like the monopoly capital crisis, et cetera. Once you realize where, where those theories come from, it's because mm -hmm. this predicted collapse didn't happen. And a whole lot of Maddox writing is basically about why he thinks that went the way. Right. Okay. Um, Today, the odor that permeates the world is that of the quote, totalitarian servitude whose outlines have become visible. So we're just blaming collective, uh, your bureaucratic uh, collectivism. Right. Yes. 
just the Soviets. The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of the ruling class. Capitalist ideology is transformed. Even totalitarian liberalism appears. And what shall we say of revolutionists? Where sin runs riot, even a deacon may slip. Nice. Where license reigns as the norm, even the straight-laced lady may begin to look with less horror on an innocent flirtation. <laughs> and I have read that dentists may get to like the odor of a decayed tooth. Gross. And so while our capitalist Democrats propose universal conscription for the militarization of the youth, Cannon enunciates the principles of a monolithic Trotskyist party. And while Frida Kirchway bewails American imperialism but concludes that its foreign policy must be upheld in the main, Johnson decides that though he does not approve of Cannon's monolithism, he yet belongs at its side. He explains that Cannon's unfortunate tendencies towards Stalinization will be taken care of by the objective historic process. Yeah, yeah so basically he's, he's, he's calling uh, uh, Cannon uh, a Bonaparte, like a Bonaparte within the Trotskyist movement, mm -hmm. which is an interesting accusation. And that, and that the person he's arguing with um, is, is uh, knowingly accepting Cannon's uh, increasing domination of the movement. Um, and I will say that does, that is part of why splits are a thing in Trotskyism, but American Trotskyists split more than most other Trotskyist groups think. Mm -hmm. Um, the British have their splits, but there's like, like I was looking at the, somebody who did the tree for the Americans did a tree for the British and there's only like five <laughs> Uh, lines to that tree as opposed oh. to like us where there's like 85. 50. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Damn. This is a funny thing to say as well because like, you know, if Cannon's unfortunate tendencies towards Stalinization will be taken care of by the objective historic process, won't Stalin's Stalinization be taken care of by the objective historic process? Well, is that, that's actually kind like of making the, it so silly, the inevitability. That's that actually was a Trotskyist defense position of the Soviet Union. So while they would condemn, um, uh, they would condemn um, the USSR even after Stalin was gone, they would also argue that we had to defend it, particularly against American imperial aggression, um, because it was in a history process that would work itself out, and the workers would eventually overthrow the the you know what we call the nomenklatura. Yeah. And establish an actual worker state through what had already been done in the first revolution. Gotcha. Okay. And it may be, you know, and what uh, this is what Mike Matt talks about in 1992. Um, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the, there's a whole lot that makes you, you can kind of tell why a whole lot of people don't want to talk about these essays now mm -hmm. because it's real hard to 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 kind of like when you when you take the long view of like okay we're almost 100 years out from this now um and we have to remember draper saw most of this he died in 1990 he did not live to yeah. see the fall of the soviet union but he was very close um like he died when i was 10 years old i just like to put, remind people of that so he I think even he probably had to had well, to eat yeah, a lot of crow. Yeah, he died like right before I was born, before his soul was brought into my Dubin <laughs> body. <laughs> it's, absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, I'm very curious as well to see what his later writing will be because you know, as opposed to a monolith, I'm sure that Draper can see nothing but cracks between you know Trotsky's well, when, organizations in particular. When we get to his history, like the anatomy of a microsect, which we are going to eventually do, we're going to take a break and do some other traditions first, and maybe something, something Maoist and something. <laughs> I'm rooting maybe, for Mao. <laughs> I want to uh, get into some Mao. Uh, and maybe, maybe some palmatic, and then maybe some actual. I don't know. Maybe we'll do some actual like. Oh, just to clarify, like Mao Zedong and Soren Mao. Yeah, yeah, Soren Mao. Um, uh, what would so amount will be done on our book reading on the on the on the Patreon side? Oh, 
when we finish with Saito. That's correct. Yeah. Although actually, I, we might do that. We we might do that as a series that I make public. I don't know. We might we might have it where I do the where I uh, if there's demand for it. Hint, comment, comment. I'm gonna do one of those times. Um, if you guys want it, um, it might be where my patrons get it a month earlier, and then you guys get it later. But I might release it to you if you want it bad enough. Well, I hope that um, we get to speak to him. So uh, yeah. just to sweeten the deal, speak to your local Varn Vlog Council representative. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> have your voice heard okay and, and, and in short leave a fucking comment if you really yeah. want that yes all right and the third answer no democratic party organization is necessary as long as we are for soviets shop committees the self-mobilization of the masses and against retrogressionism the inevitability of socialism will be at our right hand in beneficent vigil Social fatalism plays the same role today as it did for the social Democrats. I mean, I think it is interesting because one of the things we can talk about today is how most of the Trotskyist groups just liquidated into the social Democrats mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and the, de like almost all the Trotskyist tendencies, but two of them, the, the Norfites and the Grantites, um, uh, just entered the DSA and became caucuses within the DSA, often mixing with opposed Trotskyist groups in yeah. the, the, the DSA. It's actually kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, just a minute on um, retrogressionism, because this actually ties us back in to our questions about the IK that we yeah. had the last time. Which one are we talking about? The German one, IKD abroad, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, um, where do I start? You did well, some research. I did a little bit of research. Not as much as I would have liked to, but we'll get into it more for sure. So the retrogressionists had three theses that they wrote about um, around the time of the Fourth International. And the key players here are Morrow and Schachmann. Um, So in the New International, September 1944, which is just before this is written, um, Committee Abroad of the IKD, Capitalist, Barbarism, or Socialism, should ring a bell, on the development of declining capitalism uh, and on the situation, tasks, and perspectives of the labor movement. So this was written in 1943. It was uh, published in 1944. And they talk about declining capitalism and its uh, significance for the labor movement, what should be done, how it should be understood. Is this a backward, peculiar sort of movement within capitalism that denotes a new economic form? Are we regressing? Is it a retrogression? And they ended up writing um, in the 1942 December issue, uh, our three theses, which appeared in the fourth international. I'm now I'm reading a little bit from this document. Comrade Max Shackman referred repeatedly to these three theses in the new international. They were reprinted here in London too by the then still unofficial group of the Workers International League. When they were finally published in the fourth international, they actually date back to 1941. This keeps going backward in time. They were accompanied by a criticism of comrades Morrow and Morrison. Um, and in his article, Comrade Morrow explicitly called upon us to answer his criticisms, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, it took them a long time um, to kind of get back to it, but they were open to yeah. we have talking to talk about, about these criticisms. Why is the IKD, you know, exchanging so much with the Americans and the British? Well, they're actually in exile in London, which <laughs> I did not know. Yes, um, exactly. So... <laughs> If we found resolutions uh, of the Second World Congress on the Committee Abroad of the Internationalist Communists of Germany from 1948 and in 1949. So, yeah, let's get let's get into the the family trees here. The Committee Abroad (AK) of the International Communists of Germany (IKD), whose political position had been denounced as revisionist by the April 1946 International Conference, was invited by this conference to collaborate with the IEC and the IS in the task of reorganizing uh, the section in Germany. 
Immediately after this conference, the AK of the IKD publicly declared that it did not recognize the authority of the IEC and the IS elected at the conference, and that it would conduct itself with regard to their recommendations and directives accordingly. All communications sent by the IS to the AK with the aim of getting their members to participate in the international work in Germany remained unanswered. Yeah, and the Socialist Working Party here is actually the American one, just so people know. Yeah, so there's like a whole... But they consider anyone who's related to the IKD abroad as well as part of the German section here in a <laughs> resolution of the Second World Congress on the reorganization of the German section of the Fourth International. In 1933, the Committee Abroad, AK of the Internationalist Communists of Germany, IKD, was recognized as the official leadership of the German section of the Fourth International. Before things went sour, in April 1946, the International Conference directed the IEC uh, to reorganize the German section in collaboration with the AK of the IKD, the AK being the abroad part. The AK made no reply to the repeated communications of the IS on the matter. Meanwhile, the comrades of the IKD in Germany affected their organizational recruitment with the assistance of the IS and the IEC. The World Congress, therefore, provisionally recognizes the comrades in this recruitment as the German section of the Fourth International. So, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, all of the, the issues with uh, the IKD, as he's noted in footnotes in previous sections that we've read, um, it all goes back to Schachmann as well and Morrow and confusion about how to classify this new tendency of the time of um, capitalism. Is it retrogressionism? Is it a new thing? Is it barbarism itself? Are we going back to the Middle Ages? All of this, again, kind of sounds familiar to now in our post-neoliberal order, trying to understand just exactly what is going on with our current economic forms. So it's interesting yeah. to read all of this play out. Imperialism is decrining, disintegrating, wagging, antagonizing, uh, agonizing capitalism. And I just what I like... Uh, yeah, it seems like we'd heard that today, too. Yep, like, definitely. What is interesting is I think these theses are now only really important to the Norfite tradition. Um, so that's for people who don't know who those are. That's the SEP in America. God damn, I hate all these acronyms. Yeah, and, and well, I mean, there's two SWPs. There's the American Canaanite one and the, and the UK Cliffite one, which is connected... The Cliffite one is connected to the IS tradition, uh, but not till later. Like, so, <laughs> um, anyway, because Cliffism isn't a separate tradition yet. Right, um, right. No, oh, god damn. No, it's really fascinating in the um, context of trying to understand and wrap our minds around this, this conception of socialism or barbarism or the inevitability of socialism and under what particular um material conditions can this possibly arise like if we're going back to something pre-capitalism are we kind of not out of the realm of socialism arising and they had a lot of arguments about this i mean what it's interesting also when we think about shackman's the, the, the only american who sides with the ikd it's a broad section mm -hmm. but we also know that later on shackman like First goes into the S the SPA after quote abandoning Trotskyism. Uh, that doesn't happen until the fifties though. He trains Michael Harrington. They end the SPA itself, which splits three ways. One of those splits eventually becomes what we now call the DSA. The other becomes the SPUSA, uh, which I used to be involved with way a long time ago. Um, and um, so in this weird way. Even the stuff we're dealing with now in America, almost all of them go back to either splits from the CPUSA, um, our splits from the SPA or the SWP. So, like, and those and those splits between the Social Democrats and the Trotskyists overlap and separate overlap and separate overlap and separate over time so uh but it's interesting because if you're going to talk to people now who believe in retrogression or what we would now call capitalist decadence thesis or mm -hmm. um regression thesis you're dealing with people regression thesis is going to be like platypus affiliated society yeah um, oh 
Maddox came up as a Spartacist as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, uh, but a different kind of Spartacist. Okay. Like the German one. Not Okay, interesting. Not the American one. Venture to wonder their thoughts on Nambla then. Yeah. No, Maddox, Maddox actually could... Maddox uh, was a Spartacist and then he was connected directly in like to the Dutch Council of Communist position. So he knew people like Jan Appel and mm -hmm. I think he may have even known Anton Panikok. Mm -hmm. So um, he's an interesting person because like he is the American representative of the European Council Communist uh, left com or what other things would call ultra left position. Um, and he's kind of interesting because like Draper he lives most of the 20th century. So we know his thoughts mm -hmm. through from like the 20s all the way until like, I think the 80s. Yeah. He was a pamphleteer. I guess that he would have been like a vlogger in the 21st yeah. century. Well, I mean, that's what one of the things we're going to have to do some, some Matic. Actually, I actually like a lot of Matic, but like, I just, I just pull up the, uh, the Paul Maddox archives. Now he dies. He dies nine years before Draper. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he also survived World War One and World War Two, which is kind of impressive in and of itself. Yeah. His first pamphlet comes out in 1934. His last one comes out in 1979. Like he's yeah. active that entire period. So. Uh, and Draper's the same. Draper's early pamphlets, I believe, are start in the early 40s, and they go uh, until 1990. So, yeah. so I mean, th that's why I think you have to deal with some of these people, because, it, like, if, even if you're, like, a Marxist, Leninist, and don't agree with them, um, because they are documenting things for most of the century, and if you follow their footnotes, you'll understand a whole lot of what's going on. Definitely. Um, With a little extra research sprinkled in there, but it's all tangible information. A lot of this is specifically happening in uh, publications. So yeah, it, it's, it's like following, cool. you know, a long tweet thread today. <laughs> sort of. I mean, y you have to remember that like, during the internationals during this time period, they're sending like, like when they can't meet, which is for most of like the thirties to the fifties uh, and in America more than that, it's all correspondence. And then Congresses that meet separately, read the correspondence and then vote like, cause you can't promise that you can get people from like the United States into England or Germany or wherever. No, um, at least not fast enough. And so like that actually does mean from a lot of these things we do. And also the official com, uh, we have it for the official congresses too, of the first uh, of the first, second, and third international. Um, you can you can get volumes of those things. Some of the some of the second international stuff has not yet been translated, but a lot of it has. Yeah. Um, you can actually read these debates like as they were happening at the time and kind of get a better grip of it. Most people don't, but mm -hmm. it's available. Sure. Um, in fact, a whole lot of it's available for free. Yeah, on Marxist.org like, is where most of my research ended up. Happen. Yeah, you might end up at anti-revisionist.org, which is like Marxist.org has like separate sections for groups that hate each other. <laughs> That's awesome. Sometimes they just leave people out. They don't like them. Uh, uh, I don't know that they do, actually. There's, there's no, I only I only found that in our conversation about uh, Seto and the uh, Japanese Marxist schools. Um, they don't have zero um, uno, just none. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, actually, yeah. I just think that's because he's undertranslated. Like it could well be. It could, but he I is one think... of the main. I mean, one. It was one of the main uh, schools of Marxism in Japan. They probably just have fewer ties to international language speakers, like the Kuruma school had. So, anyway, for more on that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please join uh, us on our uh, Patreon only. Yeah, Seiko, and you can listen to socialism. You can listen to uh, Jordan be more and more sanguine on Sado, and me going from being very impressed to like, I don't know, dude. I don't think I think you're overreading that Marx bit. <laughs> That's um, uh, yeah, still hasn't bought me yet, but I appreciate the guy. Yeah, I think it's interesting what he's trying to do. But anyway, let's get back on this. Um, yes, because we are at the last thousand feet. Um. Yeah. While writing this, I've been reading a book, 
just published by James Ramsey Ullman on the history of the seven attempts to climb Mount Everest. Seven. That's so sweet. Summon of the world. It, it is a history of continuous defeat since World War, since First World War, yet there is no insuperable technical obstacles. More than once, men have struggled to, to within a thousand feet of the goal. Sometime back to defeat, Mallory and Irving went to, on to death, but no one has come forward with a theory that there is something inherent in the nature of man and mountains, which makes the dream utopian. And Ullman says, the world's highest mountain will someday be, uh, will someday be climbed as inevitable. As inevitable as the crossing of the oceans, the spanning of continents, the discovery of poles. And perhaps the victory will be won on the next attempt. Perhaps not for generations, but men will try. And more men and those men will get to the top. And if you ask why they will struggle, he answers. We have vanquished an enemy. And George Mallory once asked to himself, standing on his companions upon a high, hard-won summit, and looking down the long way they had come, and there was only one answer, none but ourselves. So Trotsky wrote, the present crisis in human culture is a crisis of in the proletarian leadership. Oh man, I wish it was that simple. Man, That's me talking. Uh, man struggles to conquer and control nature through a half a million years of technological revolutions from the day finds himself up before the last optical, his own society, his the last thousand feet. It too will be spanned with the with the historical inevitability of man's descent of humanity. Oh man, that is a that's a non argument. I just want to point that out, like not to be an asshole. But it's no, just, it's just a softy sort of flourish at the end to, like, to yeah, finish things that way. We'll do it. We'll do it one day because it's just like climbing mountains. Yeah, that's that's it. It's just like climbing mountains because there's nothing that's there's no natural law that says we can't. <laughs> There's no impossibility about it. That's really <laughs> funny. I mean, it is funny because I guess if you're comparing the two, he's kind of hinting maybe that we don't have the the technological ability just No, yet. actually, he says the opposite. Man struggles to conquer and control nature through half a million years of technological revolution. Today finds himself up before the last obstacle, his own society. Sure. But, like, wouldn't technology necessarily be part of... Um, that's not what he says, the though. Last obstacle. No, okay, I guess not. But um, I don't know that they're, they're necessarily exclusive. Like the technological revolution can't have totally ended because capitalism isn't at its end as well, right? Like the economic form is still evolving. The means of production are still increasing at this point in the 40s so maybe a few more boosts in in capitalism and we'll be a little bit closer to a socialist society it, it kind of rings true with other things that have been written i think in this essay but it is a very silly metaphor it's generally to, to considered a, a stalinist argument too which is why he mm. like okay, the stalinist argument is like we have to do this development it's why like we have like um like that's why we have to do all these things. There's no other way. Like right. it's inevitable, and that's why we have to plow through stuff. Um, and I mean that argument's literally made today by like a yeah. ton of people. Um, and the thing is with that argument, you can justify anything with it. Like you can justify right. literally anything with it. So, so like you're like, oh well, we just have to do what it takes. To, like, but also like, when's the cutoff point? Marx thought the cutoff point was like 1860. And a lot of these people thought end of world war. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So it's just like when it's like that, the ever present canard that we always need to develop more means of production is like, mm -hmm. well, what, you know, what do you think the goal is? Like, is the goal like fully automated, infinite power, uh, technology, um, first because if that's the case you're going to be running up against entropy eventually that's so, also true definitely yeah i don't know i i tend to and control of nature like the, we're, we're reading through all of this and there's so much of science that still hasn't even been understood and it's just getting sort of hinted at or guessed about by draper so right but like again it's not uh, we you make it sound like we understand things a lot better now i don't know that we do <laughs> which it right. depends which things <laughs> certainly right like yeah we know that like 
like we we understand things about particle physics that we didn't understand but uh um there's some basic like there's some paradigm discussions on like cognition for example human cognition where we don't agree on the basics of what the blocks we're talking about are sure right right so like i don't know i i I'm not, you know, I don't want to sound like I, I, I actually just, I think this, I think this is a cop out. Like I, my, at the end of the essay, I'm like, this is a cop out. Like you can't actually answer the question. So you're like, well, it's like climbing a mountain. Eventually we always do it. And I'm like, but that like, cl like we climb a mountain. There's two options. You either climb the mountain or you don't. <laughs> or, and you get up or you don't. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm, and by this point in time, we have something like 800 uh, people reaching the summit every year and hundreds and hundreds like every day at the base camp in um, Mount yeah. Everest. So also this one didn't age particularly well because we still don't have socialism. Sorry. Well, it's just it, it becomes a question of like. So you can go the purity fetish route, which I don't suggest people do because that's a dumb book. But I'm a, and people want to hear my opinion about that. You can also subscribe to the Patreon. But you, um, uh, you can get muscles, but don't be muscle bound. Don't be dogmatic. Um, don't be a Calvinist. Certainly. I well, I just don't know what this actually gets you. Like yeah. I, I went through all this. Like he wants to say that the phrase is justified because Marx believed it, Lenin believed it, all the internationals believed it. But it doesn't mean that we can just sit on our laurels. Um, we're willing to say retrogression is possible, but ultimately humans will overcome it. And my, my point has always been actually, and I, I felt like this for a long time, this shows a stunning lack of imagination on the possibilities of different kinds of decline. Yes. Um, and it, this is something that I wrestle with because I'm not a Whiggish historian. And I'm always like, are, are communists actually this Whiggish? Like, do they actually think the issue is just we need to develop the productive forces in this linear way? It's one of the funny things that I always I always point out to people because I'm like, well, you know, the Marxist Leninists hate G.A. Cohen, but they actually believe the same thing about productive forces, um, which classical ended Marxism does not like. And I know Marxist Leninists would be mad that I said that, but I've actually uh, I've read the the things where Marx talks about this. He's like, well, when he talks about um, in the in the critique of political economy, uh, 1859. Um, no, it's one, it's one of the later ones. He talks about like relations, like the whole base and superstructure matter before actually puts the primacy on social relations, conditioning the technology, which conditions. Yes. The code, yeah. Et mentioned mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned all the time and I get pushback on it, but I, I, I've actually, I can quote to you. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'll do it right now. Doing. This um, is like a strong way to, to end the series. Right. <laughs> um, because I do think it's actually important here uh, what what this actually kind of implies. And I also think it's true that Marx thought some of this stuff was inevitable. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's the 1859. I'm right. Contribution to critique of uh, political economy. And I'll just read the quote. In the social production of their existence, men inevitably enter into definite relations, which are independent of their will, namely the relations of production appropriate to a given stage and development of their material forces of production. Now, notice here, that sounds like the, the relations of production, uh, you know, flow forth from the material forces of production. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but notice that he has to listen. He lists relations of production first. Yeah. The totality of these relations of production constitute the economic structure of society, the real foundation, a.k.a. the base, on which arises a legal and political superstructure, and to which corresponds definite forms of social consciousness. So you will notice here that the mode is based on relations which themselves are based on what you can develop at any given period of time. So I get why people talk about the development of modes of production and why it's important, forces of production, actually, not modes. Right. 
the totality of relations and forces equals the mode and which all the superstructure you know equals now i want to also point out that marx thinks this is a feedback loop it is not that one is phenomenal to the other sure so even the legal forces and the social forces feed back into this but that's because they condition the relations of production which are then read you know maintain the mode etc so i'm going to continue reading and breaking this down to people uh, the mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. It is not the consciousness of men; uh, it is not the consciousness of men that determine their existence, but their social existence, existence that determines their consciousness. As a side note, I actually think Marx can't prove this, but it's something that he believes. Um, at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come to conflict with the existing relations of production, or and this is merely expressed the same thing in legal terms, with the property relations within a framework of which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relationship turns into feathers, thus the beginning of an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation lead to, sooner or later, the transformation of the whole immense superstructure. In studying such transformation, it is always necessary to distinguish between material transformations of the economic conditions of production, which can be determined with precision of natural science and the legal, political, religious, artistic, and philosophic, in short, the ideological forms in which men become conscious of the conflict and fight it out. Just as one does not judge an individual by what he thinks about himself. Oh, liberals, you do not like that one. Um, so that's just me. So does one cannot judge a period of transformation by its consciousness, but on the contrary, the consciousness must be explained from the contradictions of material life, from the conflict existing between the social forms of production and the relation of productions. All right, so the base determined superstructure ax axiom really requires the following things, and this is from uh, the Dictionary of Social Sciences. Yeah. Um, one, the base is the whole of productive relationships not only a given economic element, which is why the working class is part of the base. Historically, the superstructure varies and develops unevenly in society and different activities, for example, art, politics, etc. And the base superstructure relationship is reciprocal. Ingalls explains that the, superstru the superstructure, uh, the, the, the base only determines the superstructure in the last instance. Um, and good luck figuring out what that means. Um, and that's from the preface of a, a contribution to critique of political economy of 1859. Um, and you can see why it's confusing. I mean, you have to go through all these turns and twists like, okay, so we have modes, the modes actually, we have these forces of production, which, which require certain relationships to maintain. Then they develop to a certain point. We don't need the relationships anymore. You need them to change, but they don't change because there's all this ideological superstructure that's developed and reinforcing them. So then that starts to change and there's a conflict in society at large and that's manifested in the consciousness, AKA. Um, now, as a side note, uh, it is unclear and it is very unclear in Marx whether or not he thinks the consciousness here refers to an individual or not, because he also talks about people who are proletarianized. And by that, he does not just mean people who are pushed into the proletariat. He also means people who politically see their future in the proletariat uh, and thus become class traitors to the bourgeoisie, the petit bourgeois, the intellectual, whatever. Um, which is why, like, no communist, no Marxist communist organization has ever tried to limit its membership to just working class origin individuals and that was a big debate in the first international between the blanquias and the marxist all right so that even comes up here yeah mm -hmm. so how does this all relate to the inevitability question well the inevitability question actually says that like okay we're developing these forces in capitalism and they're going to make it where the relations of capitalism are redundant and that's going to lead to more and more social conflict because it's going to make more people precarious while we have the where we have more ability to meet their need. And that should inevitably lead to a revolutionary situation and socialism. The problem comes in for me um, 
this is where like this is where and you will notice there's nothing in here about like the decline of the rate of profits fall pre, our immiseration thesis it's not in there it's in other parts and mark seems inconsistent on it um but that's where that kind of comes in as a kind of mechanism to force the working class to come from the class in itself to the class for itself blah 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 the the problem at hand is i always think that we've been shown that not just that barbarism is possible, but that barbarism from the standpoint can come in many different ways, which means that the contradictions emerging from production can resolve in ways not predicted before. Or in the case of changes of capitalism, which is why I think when Marxists say, oh, there's, there's just capitalism, there's not Ford is capitalism, blah, 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 uh, you know, state capitalism, et cetera, that I'm like, well, in the broad sense, you might be correct, but you cannot actually understand the management of, of capital changing so significantly between, say, 17, 1780 to 1850, then again from like 1850 to the early 20th century, then from the early 20th century into the Great Depression, then from the Great Depression into the 70s, and then from the 70s into about 2014, probably between 2007 and 2014, and whatever the hell we're in now. Yeah. Like, those are massive shifts of capital organization, how even how money works changes in all these periods. I mean, even in capital, Marx talks about, you know, early capitalism versus industrialist capitalism, which was what he was focusing on. To think right. That it I mean, wouldn't continue to to change its face under different historical conditions is kind of absurd. Right. And I don't know that Marx thought that, but I, when we read and I and I, I make a lot of effort on this on this base and superstructure to explain why I think people need to realize that relations of production are not purely superstructural. Mm. Um but also, if you're if you're even going to maintain the metaphor, and there is a, there, I think there is a Marxist argument to say like we're really hung up on this metaphor. But it's only in one paragraph of yeah. Marx's work. Um, but although Ingalls does also talk about it, so I guess it was important to them. Um, but that this meta, even this metaphor doesn't see that the superstructure is just epiphenomenal. It's not like it doesn't actually affect things. It absolutely does. It's he's describing a feedback loop. Sure. Um, that eventually can't maintain itself. Right. Um, I suppose the question arises then is like, is this purely determined by uh, linear technical development and if that's the case you got some you you have some historical knowledge that we have now that we didn't have in the 19th century mm -hmm. which makes such wiggish positions really hard to maintain um and so i think like that's part of the whole crisis of the second half of the 20th century for marxism and in addition to all the political crises is that it's harder and harder to maintain anything like an inevitability thesis after the 1950s. And, and that is a huge problem. I was going to write this, es this essay for a publication 10 years ago called 13 Ways of Looking at No Revolution. Um, and one of the things that's problems is it was more than 13 ways. But <laughs> it was like, well, shit, you ruined my Wallace Stevens reference. And but, now you have 13 reasons, whatever, <laughs> to just to screw it up even further. Yeah. You want to stay away from that. <laughs> but uh, We'll have to choose another number. <laughs> That's no big deal. <laughs> but the um, the other issue is that I realized like it would be like each of these things each of these explanations are all post hoc, but also they're infinitely malleable. Mm. So for example, I've gone through and explained three worlds theory out of Maoism and the people, but then I'm like, it's different in the 1980s than when it was in uh, articulated in China in the 1960s. And it's different uh, after like Zach Cope and some people try to change it again in the late aughts, early 2000 teens. Um, similarly, the meaning of labor aristocracy keeps changing. So it used to mean like it, when it was first used and it's, and it's used before Marx and Lenin, 
Uh, it means like people who are who, who are wage laborers, they're technically workers, they are exploited, but they have closer relationships to the boss and thus get better treatment, more benefits, maybe even some ability to invest. Um, and thus their labor capital, like their labor aristocracy. Who is when Draper mentions the the labor aristocracy living off of the crumbs of imperialism who is he speaking about in the 40s so this is something that comes up in Engels and is picked up by Lenin, which is this idea that one of the reasons why england is the least revolutionary even though it's the it's one of the homes of capital like like by by the the end of the 20th century the consensus was the revolution was going to happen in germany because it was the least imperial developed country in europe all right um but, um, and it also had the biggest party, but that was the, the part of their explanation for that was that, like, mm -hmm. um, because there was not land and stuff to sell out, to kind of sell out the leaders of the workers movement um, through additional super profits made from abroad um, through imperialism. And thus incorporate large sections of the workers' movement into the, the the capitalist project. So it's a subset of workers, but they're kind of the leaders in Ingalls and um, and in Lenin. By the time you get to Mao, they're saying it about like all the workers in a country are all the workers in the West. Period. And then you start getting stuff like the leading lights communist organization saying like, well, labor theory of value doesn't apply. Because we have to believe that, like, there's there's these super profits, and it's not about productivity, and yeah. So, like, you have, and if you if you're going to reject labor theory of value, um, uh, you actually do more damage than you realize. Um, now, I admit, like, the more I study the history of the theories of value, the more I am also beginning to be like, I don't know, like, there's some problems here. Um, but, uh, and it's also true that most Marxists, particularly academic Marxists, but even non-academic Marxists in the, uh, in the seventies and eighties and up to probably the mid aughts up until the recession, a lot of them rejected labor theory of value, like, and, and analytic Marxists all do. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it's, it's questionable if like. Uh, if like world system theories, people actually believe in labor theory of value. And I think it depends on the, which one you're talking about, actually. And uh, like people like David Harvey did, Zizek did, uh, still does. Um, uh, but what they replace it with is not queer. So... Uh, so, like, there's this entire attempt in Eric Olin Wright, for example, to try to come up with a theory of exploitation without um, for workers that that makes Marx correct without labor theory of value. Um, and it's really complicated. It involves like. Uh, all kinds of stuff. He actually has to come up with another category. So the, in Marxism, there's like there's like oppression, which is like direct and political, and usually related to like strict extraction, or slavery, sure. or keeping our like blatant imperialism, like colonialism. Mm -hmm. And then there's like exploitation, right? Which is which can be impersonal, right? Impersonal. Mm -hmm. Well, he had to come up with another category, which I think was it's actually useful to think about called, you know, domination. So like your boss who may technically be a worker still dominates you. So it's actually the primary experience of class antagonism, even though it's, he's not the exploiter. Well, he, but like, how do you justify that when you throw out labor theory of value? And he comes up with this very complicated like stuff about... Um, uh, you know, holding potentials and and uh, um, cartelization and opportunity cost and stuff like that. That he, that he, that he tries to weave in. Um, 
Well, I mean, he's ba he basically tried to do something like what PMC theories the theorists were trying to do in his book, Understanding Class. And he was way more rigorous, like mm -hmm. way, way, way more rigorous because he actually comes up with he comes up with a lot of different subcategories and stratas for class. But the when you get to the chapter where he talks about why he rejects labor theory of value, you're just like, I don't know how you maintain this because you're yeah. saying like the primary contradiction is, you know, and capitalism is not one of oppression. It's one of exploitation. Oppression still exists because it drives accumulation. But like, like, but exploitation can't mean for him what it meant for Marx. Um. And it can't be justified in like a classical reading of Capitals Volume One through Three, um, and so yeah, that's the dominant position. That position gets dropped kind of in most Marxist after the Great Recession. So that's the return of labor theory of value, kind of. Um, of course, there is sectarian Marxist, Marxist humanist groups like that who still maintained it, but a lot of people dropped it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you will hear everybody call everyone who did all these modifications anti-Marxist. That's the you know that, that's the thing that you do on the left. Is everyone is secretly being against you, and not just wrong. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you know, this is a long tirade, but I it, like all this gets tied up into this inevitability thesis actually. And so, one of the 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 biggest things you see in post 1960s marxism is just to wave this away we just not we do, we don't i'm talking about the fact we ever believe this like what do you mean socialism is inevitable khrushchev beat us you know and then after 1992 you definitely don't hear anything about this now it has kind of been picked up recently and like certain kinds of circles like and some and like some groups on the internet like will use this to make absurd claims like uh, since there's capital involved since there's state involvement in all capital production and there's some state involvement in commodity production the entire world is already socialized that's a fun one that's a real argument that has really been made now on twitter but still i've seen it um it, and some patriotic socialists hold to this um uh and so like you can see here what well, that saves the inevitability thesis right um because we're already socialists, you just, just don't know it. We just haven't started getting into the higher faces of socialism and communism. Sure. Um, that's kind of the monopoly capital thesis too. That like capitalism has monopolized to the point that it's basically politically controlled. Uh, this is also kind of now the conclusion of uh, of uh, Brenner uh, and Dylan Riley and their seven theses in the current economy, where they kind of make a weird argument pro for joe biden but also like that like political capitalism is like keynesianism with no profits and i'm like that's just that's doesn't like so i'm like it's keynesianism that doesn't work um and, and also is impossible to be maintained are you just agreeing with mmt theory but not going to say that yeah well what, what's their take on china socialist state capitalist what's the deal there a lot of, they just shut up about it <laughs> um, probably for the best <laughs> a lot of people just set up about it i mean here's the thing if, if, if you're one of those people who will argue that 1950s ussr was state capitalist now i've noticed a lot of people who now argue this just they drop the sino-soviet split and do not mm -hmm. talk about the arguments about the soviet union from the 50s into the into the 90s even though they're quote anti-revisionist they just don't want to deal with it because it really hurts their it really hurts their argument and it also makes their a lot of them want to blame western marxism for this and makes mm -hmm. that impossible because if you know where some of these like for example the capitalist voter thesis does not come out of the french or american left it comes out of china like that was the other side of the mao debates when mao died that's the gang of four versus dumb like and the capitalist world of the accusation was not from like the French Maoists, although they pick it up, but they pick it up because they were attached to the gang of four. Like, um, and that's not just a position in like the West as in Europe and America, Marxist Leninist Maoist movements almost universally maintain that. And that's the big movements in, in like Latin America and like India. So, so that only shifts 
later. Um, and it just, there's this entire history being concocted right now. Uh, not just on these debates, but on all this stuff to just make all this shit disappear so we can pretend like, well, you just have to like, you know, support China and do it here. Yeah. But, and I don't know what China is. I will say that it's definitely fully incorporated in the capitalism. It definitely has a business cycle. Um, it, it, uh, it, it does direct industrial development. It is not financialized anywhere to the same level as the West. So there are strong differences. The state has a lot of control. It operates a lot of co-ops, but its co-ops are operated differently by firm. Um, uh, it does now have like social, partial socialized insurance. Um, but in no case does it cover all costs. And in most cases you have to pay up forward. Um, so I just bring this up because like the debates around China often seem like people who pretend that it's like it's utterly neoliberal hellhole, uh, which it's not, or people pretend that like it's, you know, as communist as the USSR in the 1950s. And in fact, they are the state capitalists and China is not. Right. And that's absurd. Yeah. Like, so, you know, in, in, in some ways, I'm I'm going to make a lot of people mad and just take a nominalist position that like, like some of these things are not actually that important. They are not; these are not essential categories of which you can actually lay out. Is there capitalist production going on in China? Yes, and um, that does mean that you are, even according to their stage theory at the lowest mode of socialist production at best, which means you still have social antagonisms, which means, which means actually curtailing criticism of that is trying to free social antagonisms. So even from their own theory, what they're doing doesn't make sense. Hmm. Um, but regardless, you know, uh, we can't just blame like the Marxist Leninist are, are the Maoists for this. Like this is universal. Like, and I don't mean like, oh, people are doing this about China. People are doing this about everything. Like, there's just this giant erasure of this history are pretending that discussing this history in and of itself is somehow anti-communist. Like, at all. Right, 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 right. right. Um, and to me, that's why I feel like, you know, as we end on Draper now, we keep on doing the same things that we've done probably since the 1940s. They keep on failing and we keep on trying to do them in dumber and dumber and less theoretically sophisticated ways with less workers involved. Yeah. Like it, it it's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, even with something like the DSA, for example, one of the interesting things I learned about the DSA, I was talking about how the DSA has like a, uh, a political hold in in New York. Well, I, I actually didn't realize this, but they had a political hold in New York in the eighties. Even got a mayor in, and in some really? ways they were yeah, and so and they were only five thousand people there. They were just really clustered in New York. Now they're still clustered in the greater New York area and in L.A. Um, but like, if you think about yes, there's like a Democratic Socialist Caucus. I don't think it actually are Democratic Socialists like movement in the in the in the state legislature in new york mm -hmm. uh, uh I, it might be a caucus i don't know but it doesn't coordinate with the different locals and the different branches actually i've been told they don't coordinate together which is kind of mm -hmm. crazy to me like they mm -hmm. don't have like a state level operation that might have changed in the last year but i got corrected for saying there was one because there is one in la um in california like a while back and i'm like no the locals wouldn't agree. i was told the locals couldn't agree on on how to do it um but what i find interesting is by any stretch of the imagination the dsa is way larger in new york than it was in the 80s it actually had more political successes in the new at the state level in the 80s oh, jesus and that's i didn't even know that that's like, crazy um so you know We've seen this. Uh, it keeps on feeling like we've seen all this happen before. And part, you know, 
you know, I, I want to talk about the socialism inevitability things because partly because I want people to remember these debates and also be accountable for them. Like, it meant that nobody won a lot of these debates. That, like, what people actually said at the time, and you've tried to bury it or ignore it, even though it's even though it's freely available, it's not censored. No, nope. the, the self-censoring in the name of what? Do, uh, well, what Draper says as well. Dogmatism and pickling formulas and formaldehyde instead of actually relating to things historically or invoking historical materialism without giving us a wonderful definition of what that is certainly but yeah. um it's, I mean, it's a totally yeah. it is a defeatist thing attitude it's not something that's going to help you understand or carry any closer whether or not you believe in inevitability if you feel there's no role for man and this is just a movement of history then you're mistaken. And even in the article, he talks about decades of a proletarian defeat at this point, which is what makes these yeah. debates super necessary to have and to consider. So if we're going to sweep it under the rug with decades and decades more of defeat in our yeah, wake. Almost 100 years more of defeat. Like, just think about it. Like the socialist yeah. movement. If I if I take the socialist movement as when it started calling itself socialist, so uh, either the late 18th or early 19th century, right? You have the San Simonians, the Blancist. I think the Blanc. I think Blanc may have been one of the first people to use the word socialist. He also may have been one of the first people to use the word capitalist. Uh, that is Louis Blanc. Um, uh, and then you have the Blanquist and the Proudhonist and the Kropotkinites and the anarcho-socialists and anarcho-communists. I mean, like, <laughs> but, you know, that's just not not even dealing with it in the Bakutinist, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not even dealing with the different kinds of Marxisms that have emerged, both politically and theoretically. Um, there's There is basically... 200 years of failure with successes but all the successes frankly do not fit the model and Which should bring you back to the drawing board a little bit right right but the other problem that it has is yet they justify what they do according to the model so it's like it's like well you know we had the socialist revolution but we got to like you know, build capitalism and maybe do it less imperialistically, we hope, but like, we got to do that. And, you know, if we have to kill a few hundred thousand people on the way, then that, you know, that was an accident and it sucks. Um, but, you know, what are they suppressing? We're, we're clearly never suppressing working class people. Like, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure you're not. Like, um, all that said, I also don't know that you can easily condemn any of these people too. Like the 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 attitude that like oh they never meant it in China. It's it was always just capitalist roadism. Do China attempted to do things um, in the 1970s and they got their biggest like improvements in lifespan and stuff uh, between the 50s and the 70s mm -hmm. that no other socialist society have attempted to do. Like they they really try to get rid of money. Like uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, like, to say that, like, oh, that was all nothing and that they never meant it, I also find that ridiculous. Like, that's totally. that to me is like a, an unfair uh, proposition. Um, so, but I also just, I think you have to judge these things on a more complicated rubric than just like, well, what people who say they're a socialist and are trying to build socialists are good. Um, and people who critique them are bad, or well, it was all dirty state capitalism anyway, and it was never worth doing. And like the real left needs to do X, let's go fetishize a bunch of things that failed and do yes. them over and over again. Um, and have you heard about my my uh real big fantasy about the Spanish Civil War? Like, the, those are the things that frustrate me. Um, about all of this is because, you know, I, and to be fair, we're, we're like yelling at kids for not knowing this in some ways. And you can't like who was going to teach him this. 
right? Us, basically, but like, That's the idea, hopefully. But, but like, in all seriousness, like, who's going to teach them this? Like, I'm sure a lot of the people they encounter on the left don't know it either. Like, there's there is this big like burying of the past. If you read Max Ebaum's books, and he's actually pretty sympathetic to Marxist Leninism, uh, Revolution in the Air, he talks a lot about how a lot of the stuff just disappears into nothing in the 1980s. And you people didn't even follow what happened. Like, what happened to all these people? When did they go? A lot of them just became Democrats, even though what's Stalin the hypothesis gone. for the, the timing? The well, because there was no mass revolutionary movement, and also one of the things where people are like, oh, well, when the Soviet Union was around, capitalism was scared was scared enough to play night would play nice. And I think there's some truth to that in the 1930s. But they neoliberalism happens two decades before the Soviet Union falls. They, like, and the decline but, was obvious all along the way. Like, yeah, the, the decline is pretty clear by the late 60s. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, and this is the thing, like, okay, name societies didn't last very long. Okay, there's a confederacy that lasted for four years. There's Athenian democracy, I think that lasted for about 50. And there is, uh, um, the Soviet Union, which 1917 to 1992, that's not even 80 years. Yeah. So, like... What does that say? Like when people keep on bringing all this up as a success and I'm like, and they're like, oh, they were besieged by it. I'm like, yeah, but we always knew that was going to happen. Like we all, everyone knew that capital, like, do you think the capitals were just going to fucking roll over and, oh, they were imperialist against each other. Do you think they were going to drop it against <laughs> like, what, what, what on earth would make you think that like, um, we pretty much this, I mean, this is going to sound weirdly pro bomb, but we pretty much escape a century of even more wars than we had because both sides had nuclear weapons. Like, I don't know. I, I, I know I sound, I sound defeatist right now, but I just, I just find it very hard when you read these things and, and they're already talking about the problems of defeat. And then, like, people just want to skip it. And I find it very interesting right now what you're dealing with as as the DSA has kind of fell into a labyrinth. What you see is people just going to different things in the past and trying to do them again without without any of the context. I mean, even if you thought they were good, you don't exist in that social context. That sure, social context does not exist. Absolutely. No right? doubt. Absolutely. And it's generally kind of the opposite of learning from the past is just trying to LARP the past in totally different context without understanding the consequences, the outcomes of the one that it was in and what yours are materially. I, I mean, it's basically, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically like civil war reenactment with, with, uh, n with no fake pistols, but I guess better uniforms. So, like, oh God, I think that's well, that might be a very <laughs> wonderful place to end this <laughs> particular <laughs> conversation. It was an interesting essay. I was really happy to read through it. I learned specifically more about the times than I did, uh, you know, the formulas themselves, uh, a lot of Draper's thought, which will go on to, you know, evolve and change over time, his critical lens in particular. And it was a great foray. So, I'm very happy to have uh, accomplished this with you. Yeah. And we will come back to Draper in the future. We're going to do some other stuff. All right. And on that note, bye.